Lives of the Eminent Rhetoricians from the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Petonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Cheng. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Petonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Lies of the Eminent Rhetoricians, paragraphs 1 through 6. Rhetoric also, as well as grammar, was not introduced amongst us till a late period, and with still more difficulty, inasmuch as we find that at times the practice of it was even prohibited. In order to leave no doubt of this, I will subjoin an ancient decree of the Senate, as well as an edict of the censors. In the consulship of Gaius Fannius Strabo at Marcus Palerius Messila, the praetor Marcus Pomponius moved the Senate that an act be passed respecting philosophers and rhetoricians. In this matter they have decreed as follows. It shall be lawful for Marcus Pomponius the praetor to take such measures and make such provisions as the good of the Republic and the duty of his office require, that no philosophers or rhetoricians be suffered at Rome. After some interval, the censor Cnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus and Lucius Licinius Crassus issued the following edict upon the same subject. It is reported to us that certain persons have instituted a new kind of discipline, that our youth resort to their schools, that they have assumed the title of Latin rhetoricians, and that young men waste their time there for whole days together. Our ancestors have ordained what instruction it is fitting their children should receive, and what schools they should attend. These novelties, contrary to the customs and instructions of our ancestors, we neither approve, nor do they appear to us good. Wherefore it appears to be our duty that we should notify our judgment both to those who keep such schools, and those who are in the practice of frequenting them, that they meet our disapprobation. However, by slow degrees, rhetoric manifested itself to be a useful and honourable study, and many persons devoted themselves to it, both as a means of defence and of acquiring a reputation. Cicero declaimed in Greek until his praetorship, but afterwards, as he grew older, in Latin also, and even in the consulship of Hertius and Panser, whom he calls his great and noble disciples. Some historians state that Gnaeus Pompey resumed the practice of declaiming even during the civil war, in order to be better prepared to argue against Gaius Curio, a young man of great talents, to whom the defence of Caesar was entrusted. They say, likewise, that it was not forgotten by Mark Antony, nor by Augustus, even during the war of Modena. Nero also declaimed, even after he became emperor, in the first year of his reign, which he had done before in public but twice. Many speeches of orators were also published. In consequence, public favour was so much attracted to the study of rhetoric that a vast number of professors and learned men devoted themselves to it, and it flourished to such a degree that some of them raised themselves by it to the rank of senators and the highest offices. But the same mode of teaching was not adopted by all, nor indeed did individuals always confine themselves to the same system but each varied his plan of teaching according to circumstances. For they were accustomed in stating their argument with the utmost clearness to use figures and apologies, to put cases as circumstances required, and to relate facts, sometimes briefly and succinctly, and at other times more at large and with greater feeling. Nor did they omit on occasion to resort to translations from the Greek, and to expatiate in the praise or to launch their censures on the faults of illustrious men. They also dealt with matters connected with everyday life, pointing out such as are useful and necessary, and such as are hurtful and needless. They had occasion often to support the authority of fabulous accounts, and to detract from that of historical narratives, which sort the Greeks call propositions, refutations, and corroboration, until by a gradual process they have exhausted these topics, and arrive at the gist of the argument. Among the ancients, subjects of controversy were drawn either from history, as indeed some are even now, or from actual facts of recent occurrence. It was therefore the custom to state them precisely, with details of the names of places. We certainly so find them collected and published, and it may be well to give one or two of them literally by way of example. 
A company of young men from the city, having made an excursion to Ostia in the summer season, and going down to the beach, fell in with some fishermen who were casting their nets in the sea. Having bargained with them for the haul, whatever it might turn out to be, for a certain sum, they paid down the money. They waited a long time while the nets were being drawn, and when at last they were dragged on shore, there was no fish in them, but some gold sewn up in a basket. The buyers claim the haul is theirs, the fishermen assert that it belongs to them. Again, some dealers having to land from a ship at Brindisium a cargo of slaves, among which there was a handsome boy of great value, they, in order to deceive the collectors of the customs, smuggled him ashore in the dress of a free-born youth, with a bullum hung about his neck. The fraud easily escaped detection. They proceed to Rome. The affair becomes a subject of judicial inquiry. It is alleged that the boy was entitled to his freedom because his master had voluntarily treated him as free. Formerly, they called these by a Greek term, syntaxis, but of late controversies. But they may be either fictitious cases or those which come under trial in the courts. Of the eminent professors of this science, of whom any memorials are extant, it would not be easy to find many others than those of whom I shall now proceed to give an account. Lucius Plotius Gallus. Of him Marcus Tullius Cicero thus writes to Marcus Titinius, I remember well that when we were boys, one Lucius Plotius first began to teach Latin, and as great numbers flocked to his school, so that all who were most devoted to study were eager to take lessons from him, it was a great trouble to me that I too was not allowed to do so. I was prevented, however, by the decided opinion of men of the greatest learning, who considered that it was best to cultivate the genius by the study of Greek. This same Gallus, for he lived to a great age, was pointed at by Marcus Caelius in a speech which he was forced to make in his own cause, as having supplied his accuser, Atrachinus, with materials for his charge. Suppressing his name, he says that such a rhetorician was like barley bread, compared to a wheaten loaf. Windy, chaffy, and coarse. Lucius Octacilius Pilatus is said to have been a slave, and according to the old custom, a chained to the door like a watchdog, until, having been presented with his freedom for his genius and devotion to learning, he drew up for his patron the act of accusation in a cause he was prosecuting. After that, becoming a professor of rhetoric, he gave instructions to Gnaeus Pompey the Great, and composed an account of his actions, as well as those of his father, being the first freedman, according to the opinion of Cornelius Nepos, who ventured to write history, which before his time had not been done by any one who was not of the highest ranks in society. About this time, Epidius, having fallen into disgrace for bringing a false accusation, opened a school of instruction, in which he taught, among others, Mark Antony and Augustus. On one occasion, Gaius Canutius jeered them for presuming to belong to the party of the consul Isauricus in his administration of the Republic, upon which he replied that he would rather be the disciple of Isauricus than of Apidius, the false accuser. This Apidius claimed to be descended from Apidius Nuncio, who, as ancient traditions assert, fell into the fountain of the river Sarnus when the streams were overflown, and not being afterwards found, was reckoned among the number of the gods. Sextus Clodius, a native of Sicily, a professor both of Greek and Latin eloquence, had bad eyes and a facetious tongue. It was a saying of his that he lost a pair of eyes from his intimacy with Mark Antony, the triumvir. Of his wife Fulvia, when there was a swelling in one of her cheeks, he said that she tempted the point of his style. Nor did Antony think any of the worse of him for the joke, but quite enjoyed it. And soon afterwards, when Antony was consul, he even made him a large grant of land, which Cicero charges him with in his Philippics. You patronise, he said, a master of the schools for the sake of his buffoonery, and make a rhetorician one of your pot companions, allowing him to cut his jokes on any one he pleased. A witty man, no doubt, but it was an easy matter to say smart things of such as you and your companions. But listen, conscript fathers, while I tell you what reward was given to this rhetorician, and let the wounds of the Republic be laid bare to view. You assign two thousand acres of the Leontine territory to Sextus Clodius the rhetorician, and, not content with that, exonerated the estate from all taxes. Hear this, and learn from the extravagance of the grant how little wisdom is displayed in your acts. Gaius Albutius Silas of Novara, while in the execution of the office of Edal in his native place, 
who was sitting for the administration of justice, was dragged by the feet from the tribunal by some persons against whom he was pronouncing a decree. In great indignation at this usage, he made straight for the gate of the town and proceeded to Rome. There he was admitted to fellowship and lodged with Plancus the orator, whose practice it was before he made a speech in public to set up someone to take the contrary side in the argument. The office was undertaken by Albutius with such success that he silenced Plancus, who did not venture to put himself in competition with him. This bringing him into notice, he collected an audience of his own, and it was his custom to open the question proposed for debate sitting. But as he warmed with the subject, he stood up and made his peroration in that posture. His declamations were of different kinds, sometimes brilliant and polished, at others, that they might not be thought to savour too much of the schools, he curtailed them of all ornament, and used only familiar phrases. He also pleaded causes, but rarely, being employed in such as were of the highest importance, and in every case undertaking the peroration only. In the end he gave up practising in the forum, partly from shame, partly from fear. For, in a certain trial before the court of the one hundred, having lashed the defendant as a man void of natural affection for his parents, he called upon him by a bold figure of speech to swear by the ashes of his mother and father which lay unburied. His adversary taking him up for the suggestion, and the judges frowning upon it, he lost his cause and was much blamed. At another time, on a trial for murder at Milan, before Lucius Piso the proconsul, having to defend the culprit, he worked himself up to such a pitch of vehemence that in a crowded court who loudly applauded him, notwithstanding all the efforts of the lictor to maintain order, he broke out into a lamentation on the miserable state of Italy, then in danger of being again reduced, he said, into the form of a province, and, turning to the statue of Marcus Brutus, which stood in the forum, he invoked him as the founder and vindicator of the liberties of the people. For this he narrowly escaped a prosecution. Suffering at an advanced period of life from an ulcerated tumour, he returned to Navarra, and calling the people together in a public assembly, addressed them in a set speech of considerable length, explaining the reasons which induced him to put an end to existence. And this he did by abstaining from food. End of Lives of the Eminent Rhetoricians Lives of the Poets from the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. The Lives of the Poets. The Life of Terence. Publius Terentius Afer a native of Carthage, was a slave at Rome, of the senator Terentius Lucanus, who, struck by his abilities and handsome person, gave him not only a liberal education in his youth, but his freedom when he arrived at years of maturity. Some say that he was a captive taken in war, but this, as Finestella informs us, could by no means have been the case, since both his birth and death took place in the interval between the termination of the Second Punic War and the commencement of the Third, nor, even supposing that he had been taken prisoner by the Numidian or Gutellian tribes, could he have fallen into the hands of a Roman general, as there was no commercial intercourse between the Italians and Africans until after the fall of Carthage. Terence lived in great familiarity with many persons of high station, and especially with Scipio Africanus and Caius Delius, whose favour he is even supposed to have purchased by the foulest means. But Fenestella reverses the charge, contending that Terence was older than either of them. Cornelius Nepos, however, informs us that they were all of nearly equal age, and Portius intimates a suspicion of this criminal commerce in the following passage. While Terence plays the wanton with the great, and recommends himself to them by the matricious ornaments of his person, while, with greedy ears, he drinks in the divine melody of Africanus's voice, while he thinks of being a constant guest at the table of Furius, and the handsome Lelius, while he thinks that he is fondly loved by them, and often is invited to Albanum for his youthful beauty, he finds himself stripped of his property, and reduced to the lowest state of indigence. Then, withdrawing from the world, he betook himself to Greece, 
where he met his end, dying at Stromphalos, a town in Arcadia. What availed him the friendship of Scipio, of Laelius, or of Furius, three of the most affluent nobles of that age? They did not even minister to his necessities so much as provide to him a hired house, to which his slave might return with the intelligence of his master's death. He wrote comedies, the earliest of which, the Andrea, having to be performed at the public spectacles, is given by the Adeles. He was commanded to read it first before Cacelius, having been introduced while Cacelius was at supper, and being meanly dressed, he is reported to have read the beginning of the play seated on a low stool near the great man's couch. But after reciting a few verses, he was invited to take his place at table, and having supped with his host, went through the rest to his great delight. This play and five others were received by the public with similar applause, although Volcatius, in his enumeration of them, says that the Hakira must not be reckoned among these. The eunuch was even acted twice in the same day, and earned more money than any comedy, whoever was the writer, had ever done before, namely eight thousand sesterces, besides which a certain sum accrued to the author for the title. But Varro prefers the opening of the Adelphi to that of Menander. It is very commonly reported that Terence was assisted in his works by Laelius and Scipio, with whom he lived in such great intimacy. He gave some currency to this report himself, nor did he ever attempt to defend himself against it, except in a light way, as in the prologue to the Adelphi. Nam quod isti duncat malavi, hominis nohilis, hunc adjure, asudec una scribere, quod ili maledictum vehemens existimant, em laudem hic ducit maximum, cum illis placet, qui vobus universis e populo placent, quorum opera in bello, in otio, in negatio, suo quisque tempore usus est sine superia. For this, which malice tells that certain noble persons assist the bard, and ride in concert with him, that which they deem a heavy slander, he esteems his greatest praise, that he can please those who in war, in peace, as counsellors, have rendered you the dearest services, and ever borne their faculties so meekly. Common. He appears to have protested against this imputation with less earnestness, because the notion was far from being disagreeable to Laelius and Scipio. It therefore gained ground, and prevailed in after times. Quintus Memmius, in his speech in his own defence, says, Publius Africanus, who borrowed from Terence a character, which he had acted in private, brought it on the stage in his name. Nepos tells us he found in some book that C. Lelius, when he was on some position at Puteoli, on the Calends, the first, of March, being requested by his wife to rise early, begged her not to suffer him to be disturbed, as he had gone to bed late, having been engaged in writing with more than usual success. On her asking him to tell her what he had been writing, he repeated the verses which are found in the Hutin Timorominos. Satis pol proterve, misiri promessa, Hutin, 4, 4, 1. In faith, the rogue's serious is impudent pretenses. Santra is of opinion that if Terence required any assistance in his compositions, he would not have had recourse to Scipio and Lelius, who were then very young men, but rather to Sulpicius Gallus, an accomplished scholar, who had been the first to introduce his plays at the games given by the consuls, or to Q. Fabius Lobio, or Marcus Popilius, both men of consular rank, as well as poets. It was for this reason that, in alluding to the assistance he had received, he did not speak of his coadjutors as very young men, but as persons of whose services the people had full experience in peace, in war, and in the administration of affairs. After he had given his comedies to the world, at a time when he had not passed his thirty-fifth year, in order to avoid suspicion, as he found others publishing their works under his name, or else to make himself acquainted with the modes of life and habits of the Greeks, for the purpose of exhibiting them in his plays, he withdrew from home, to which he never returned. Volcatius gives this account of his death. Sudit affer se populo dedit commodius, iter hic in asiem fecit, navem cum semel consinit, visus nunquam est, sic vita vacit. When Offer had produced six plays for the entertainment of the people, he embarked for Asia, but from the time he went on board ship he was never seen again. Thus he ended his life. 
Q. Consequentius reports that he perished at sea on his voyage back from Greece, and that one hundred and eight plays, of which he had made a version from Menander, were lost with him. Others say that he died at Stymphalos, in Arcadia, or in Leucadia, during the consulship of Sen Cornius Dalabella and Marcus Fulvius Nobilior, worn out with a severe illness, and with a grief and regret for the loss of his baggage, which he had sent forward in a ship that was wrecked, and contained the last new plays he had written. In person, Terence is reported to have been rather short and slender, with a dark complexion. He had an only daughter, who was afterwards married to a Roman knight, and he left also twenty acres of garden-ground, on the Appian Way, at the Villa of Mars. I therefore wonder the more how Portius could have written the verses, Nihil Publius, Scipio Prefuit, Nihil et Lelius, Nihil Furius, Tres per edem tempus qui agitabant nobilis facilime, Iorum ille opera ne domum quidem habituet conductitaem, saltum et esset, quo referet obitum domini servilis. Africanus places him at the head of all the comic writers, declaring in his Compitalia, Terentio non similum disis quempium, Terence's equal cannot soon be found. On the other hand, Volcatius reckons him inferior not only to Navius, Plautus, and Cicelius, but also to Licinius. Cicero pays him this high compliment in his limo, Tu quoque qui solus lecto sermone terenti, conversum expressumque latine voce mandrenum, in medio populi sedatis vocibus offers, quid quid cum loquens, ac omnia dulcia decens. You only, Terence, translated into Latin, and clothed in choice language, the plays of Menander, and brought them before the public, who in crowded audiences hung upon hushed applause, grace marked each line, and every period charmed. So also Caius Caesar, tu quoque tu in summis, o dimidiate Menander, poneris et merito puri sermonis amator, lenibus atque atinam scriptus adjuncta foret vis, comica ut aquato virtus polaret honore, cum graces neca in hoc despectus parte jaceres, unum hac maseror, et doleo tibi dice terenti. You, too, who divide your honours with Menander, will take your place among poets of the highest order, and justly, too, such is the purity of your style. Would only that to your graceful diction was added more comic force, that your works might equal in merit the Greek masterpieces, and your inferiority in this particular should not expose you to censure. This is my only regret. In this, Terence, I grieve to say you are wanting. THE LIFE OF JUVENAL D. Junius Juvenalis, who was either the son of a wealthy freedman, or brought up by him, it is not known which, declaimed till the middle of life, more from the bent of his inclination, than from any desire to prepare himself either for the schools or the forum. But having composed a short satire, which was clever enough, on Paris, the actor of pantomimes, and also on the poet of Claudius Nero, who was puffed up by having held some inferior military rank for six months only, he afterwards devoted himself with much zeal to that style of writing. For a while, indeed, he had not the courage to read them even to a small circle of auditors, but it was not long before he recited his satires to crowded audiences, and with entire success, and this he did twice or thrice, inserting new lines among those which he had originally composed. Quod non dant proceris, dabit histrio, tu camerinos, et barius, tu nobilum magna atria curus, prefectos pelopia facet, philomena tribunos. Behold, an actor's patronage affords a surer means of rising than a lord's, and wilt thou still the Camerino's court, or the halls of Barius resort, when tribunes philopia can create, and philomela prefix, who shall rule the state? At that time the player was in high favour at court, and many of those who fawned upon him were daily raised to posts of honour. Juvenal therefore incurred the suspicion of having covertly satirised occurrences which were then passing, and although eighty years old at that time, he was immediately removed from the city, being sent into honourable banishment as a prefect of a cohort, which was under orders to proceed to a station at the extreme frontier of Egypt. 
that sort of punishment was selected, as it appeared severe enough for an offence which was venial, and a mere piece of drollery. However, he died very soon afterwards, worn down by grief, and weary of his life. THE LIFE OF PERSEUS Aulus Perseus Flaccus was born on the day before the Nones of December, 4th December, in the consulship of Fabius Persicus and L. Vitellius. He died on the 8th of the Calends of December, in the consulship of Rubius Marius and Asinius Gallus. Though born at Volterra, in Etruria, he was a Roman knight, allied both by blood and marriage to persons of the highest rank. He ended his days at an estate he had at the eighth milestone on the Appian Way. His father, Flaccus, who died when he was barely six years old, left him under the care of guardians, and his mother, Fulvia Selena, who afterwards married Fusius, a Roman knight, buried him also in a very few years. Perseus Flaccus pursued his studies at Volterra till he was twelve years old, and then continued them at Rome, under Remius Pelamon, the grammarian, and Virginius Flaccus, the rhetorician. Arriving at the age of twenty-one, he formed a friendship with Aeneas Cortunus, which lasted through life, and from him he learned the rudiments of philosophy. Among his earliest friends were Cassius Bassus and Colpurnius Datura, the latter of whom died while Perseus himself was yet in his youth. Servilius Numanus he reverenced as a father. Through Cornutus he was introduced to Aeneas, as well as to Lucan, who was of his own age, and also a disciple of Cornutus. At that time Cornutus was a tragic writer. He belonged to the sect of the Stoics, and left behind him some philosophical works. Lucan was so delighted with the writings of Perseus Flaccus that he could scarcely refrain from giving loud tokens of applause while the author was reciting them, and declared that they had the true spirit of poetry. It was late before Perseus made the acquaintance of Seneca, and then he was not much struck with his natural endowments. At the house of Cornutus he enjoyed the society of two very learned and excellent men, who were then zealously devoting themselves to philosophical inquiries, namely, Claudius Agriternus, a physician from Lacedaemon, and Petronius Aristocrates, of Magnesia, men whom he held in the highest esteem, and with whom he vied in their studies, as they were of his own age, being younger than Cornutus. During nearly the last ten years of his life, he was much beloved by Thracius, so that he sometimes travelled abroad in his company, and his cousin Aria was married to him. Perseus was remarkable for gentle manners, for a modesty amounting to bashfulness, a handsome form, and an attachment to his mother, sister, and aunt, which was most exemplary. He was frugal and chaste. He left his mother and sister twenty thousand sesterces, requesting his mother, in a written codicil, to present to Cornutus, as some say, one hundred sesterces, or, as others, twenty pounds of wrought silver, besides about seven hundred books, which indeed included his whole library. Cornutus, however, would only take the books, and gave up the legacy to the sisters, whom his brother had constituted his heirs. He wrote seldom, and not very fast, even the work we possessed he left incomplete. Some verses are wanting at the end of the book, but Cornutus thoughtlessly recited it, as if it was finished, and on Cassius Bassus requesting to be allowed to publish it, he delivered it to him for that purpose. In his younger days Perseus had written a play, as well as an itinerary, with several copies of verses on Thracius's father-in-law, and Aria's mother, who had made away with herself before her husband. But Cornutus used his whole influence with the mother of Perseus to prevail upon her to destroy these compositions. As soon as his book of satires was published, all the world began to admire it, and were eager to buy it up. He died of a disease in the stomach, in the thirtieth year of his age. But no sooner had he left school and his masters than he set to work with great vehemence to compose satires, from having read the tenth book of Lucilius, and made the beginning of that book his model presently launching his invectives all around with so little scruple that he did not spare cotemporary poets and orators, and even lashed Nero himself, who was then the reigning prince. The verse ran as follows. Auriculus asini mede rex habit. King Midas has an ass's ears. But Cornutus altered it thus. Auriculus asini quis non hehet. Who has not an ass's ears? In order that it might not be supposed that it was meant to apply to Nero. THE LIFE OF Horace. Horatius Flaccus was a native of Venetium, 
his father having been, by his own account, a freedman and collector of taxes, but, as it is generally believed, a dealer in salted provisions, for some one with whom Horace had a quarrel, jeered him by saying, "'How often have I seen your father wiping his nose with his fist?' In the Battle of Philippi he served as a military tribune, which post he filled at the instance of Marcus Brutus, the general, and having obtained a pardon, on the overthrow of his party, he purchased the office of scribe to a quaestor. Afterwards insinuating himself first into the good graces of Macanus, and then of Augustus, he secured no small share in the regard of both. And first, how much Macanus loved him may be seen by the epigram in which he says, Nita viceribus meus horati, plus jam diligo, titium soldalum, geno tividius strigo siorum. But it was more strongly exhibited by Augustus, in a short sentence uttered in his last moments, Be as mindful of Horatius Flaccus as you are of me. Augustus offered to appoint him as secretary, signifying his wishes to Macanus in a letter to the following effect. Hitherto I have been able to write my own epistles to friends, but now I am too much occupied, and in an infirm state of health. I wish, therefore, to deprive you of our Horace. Let him leave, therefore, your luxurious table, and come to the palace, and he shall assist me in writing my letters. And upon his refusing to accept the office, he neither exhibited the smallest displeasure, nor ceased to heap upon him tokens of his regard. Letters of his are extant, from which I will make some short extracts to establish this. Use your influence over me with the same freedom as you would do if we were living together as friends. In so doing you will be perfectly right, and guilty of no impropriety, for I could wish that our intercourse should be on that footing, if your health admitted of it. And again, how I hold you in memory you may learn from our friend Septimius, for I happened to mention you when he was present, and if you are so proud as to scorn my friendship, that is no reason why I should lightly esteem yours in return. Besides this, among other drolleries, he often called him his most immaculate penis, and his charming little man, and loaded him from time to time with proofs of his munificence. He admired his works so much, and was so convinced of their enduring fame, that he directed him to compose the secular poem, as well as that on the victory of his stepsons Tiberius and Drusus over the Vindelici, and for this purpose urged him to add, after a long interval, a fourth book of odes to the former three. After reading his sermons, in which he found no mention of himself, he complained in these terms, "'You must know that I am very angry with you, because in most of your works of this description you do not choose to address yourself to me. Are you afraid that, in times to come, your reputation will suffer, in case it should appear that you lived on terms of intimate friendship with me?' And he wrung from him the eulogy which begins with, "'Come tot sustinius, et tanta negotia solus, res italias, armis tuteris, moribus ornis, legibus emendis, in publica commodi pecum, si longo sermone moro tua tempora, Caesar, epist two one. While you alone sustain the important weight of Rome's affairs, so various and so great, while you the public wheel with arms defend, adorn with morals, and with laws amend, shall not the tedious letter prove a crime that steals one moment of our Caesar's time? Francis. In person, Horace was short and fat, as he is described by himself in his satires, and by Augustus in the following letter. Dionysius has brought me your small volume, which, little as it is, not to blame you for that, I shall judge favourably. You seem to me, however, to be afraid lest your volume should be bigger than yourself. But if you are short in stature, you are corpulent enough. You may, therefore, if you will, write in a court, when the size of your volume is as large round as your paunch. It is reported that he was immoderately addicted to venery, for he is said to have had obscene pictures so disposed in a bedchamber lined with mirrors, that whichever way he looked, lascivious images might present themselves to his view. He lived for the most part in the retirement of his farm, on the confines of the Sabine and the Tiburtine territories, and his house is shown in the neighbourhood of a little wood, not far from Tiber. Some elegies ascribed to him, and a prose epistle apparently written to commend himself to Mechanese, have been handed down to us, but I believe that neither of them are genuine works of his, for the elegies are commonplace, and the epistle is wanting in perspicuity, a fault which cannot be imputed to his style. He was born on the 6th of the Ides of December, 27th December, 
in the consulship of Lucius Cata and Lucius Torquatus, and died on the 5th of the Calends of December, 27th November, in the consulship of Caius Marcius Censorinus and Caius Asinius Gallus, having completed his fifty-ninth year. He made a nuncupatory will, declaring Augustus his heir, not being able, from the violence of his disorder, to sign one in due form. He was interred and lies buried on the skirts of the Esquiline Hill, near the tomb of Mecanus. M. Aeneas Lucanus, a native of Corduba, first tried the powers of his genius in an encomium on Nero, at the Quinquennial Games. He afterwards recited his poem on the civil war carried on between Pompey and Caesar. His vanity was so immense, and he gave such liberty to his tongue, that in some preface, comparing his age and his first efforts with those of Virgil, he had the assurance to say, And now what remains for me is to deal with a gnat. In his early youth, after being long informed of the sort of life his father led in the country, in consequence of an unhappy marriage, he was recalled from Athens by Nero, who admitted him into the circle of his friends, and even gave him the honour of the quaestorship, but he did not long remain in favour. Smarting at this, and having publicly stated that Nero had withdrawn, all of a sudden, without communicating with the Senate, and without any other motive than his own recreation, after this he did not cease to assail the emperor, both with foul words and with acts which are still notorious. So that on one occasion, when easing his bowels in the common privy, there being a louder explosion than usual, he gave vent to the nemistic of Nero. One would suppose it was thundering underground, in the hearing of those who were sitting there for the same purpose, and who took to their heels in much consternation. In a poem also, which was in every one's hands, he severely lashed both the emperor and his most powerful adherents. At length he became nearly the most active leader in Piso's conspiracy, and while he dwelt without reserve in many quarters on the glory of those who dipped their hands in the blood of tyrants, he launched out into open threats of violence, and carried them so far as to boast that he would cast the emperor's head at the feet of his neighbors. When, however, the plot was discovered, he did not exhibit any firmness of mind. A confession was wrung from him without much difficulty, and humbling himself to the most abject entreaties, he even named his innocent mother as one of the conspiracies, hoping that his want of natural affection would give him favour in the eyes of a parricidal prince. Having obtained permission to choose his mode of death, he wrote notes to his father, containing corrections of some of his verses, and having made a full meal, allowed a physician to open the veins in his arms. I have also heard it said that his poems were offered for sale, and commented upon, not only with care and diligence, but also in a trifling way. THE LIFE OF Pliny. Plinius Secundus, a native of New Como, having served in the wars with strict attention to his duties, in the rank of a knight, distinguished himself also, by the great integrity with which he administered the high functions of a procurator for a long period, in the several provinces entrusted to his charge. But still he devoted so much attention to literary pursuits, that it would not have been an easy matter for a person who enjoyed entire leisure, to have written more than he did. He comprised in twenty volumes an account of all the various wars carried on in successive periods with the German tribes. Besides this, he wrote a natural history, which extended to seven books. He fell a victim to the calamitous event which occurred in Campania. For, having the command of the fleet at Misenum, when Vesuvius was throwing up a fiery eruption, he put to sea with his galleys for the purpose of exploring the causes of the phenomenon close on the spot. But being prevented by contrary winds from sailing back, he was suffocated in the dense cloud of dust and ashes. Some, however, think that he was killed by his slave, having implored him to put an end to his sufferings, when he was reduced to the last extremity by the fervent heat. End of the Lives of the Poets End of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars 